Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Church this morning. We're glad that you are here with us. Welcome to all those joining us online as well. Thank you for joining us. If you could do us a favor, if you are new to Grace, either online or in person, if you could uh, let us know that you are here. Uh, if you're here in the room, there are connection cards in the seat backs in front of you, and you can just jot down your name and then whatever information you're comfortable sharing with us, and then you can drop those uh, in the donation boxes on your way out today. If you're online, there'll be a link in the chat window. You can fill out one of our digital connection cards, and uh, we would appreciate that. If you are here in person, go back to our connections booth after the service. We have a gift to give you. We have a coffee mug as well as a coupon for free drink at our Dada Grace Cafe, which is open between our two sources. So you can use that next week. Come a little early, grab a cup of coffee and an espresso or a ton soda and enjoy that. Um, also, if you are a regular attender or member, please let us know that you are here by checking in on the Church Center app, or you can jot your name down on the connection card as well. On the back of the connection card is the place for you to put down prayer requests and our staff list those uh, requests up to the Lord each and every week. So please let us know how we can be praying for you and uh, supporting you in that way. Uh, we have a lot going on for our church family. We want to tell you about it. So here is our Grace News video for the week. Stellar VBS coming up in July 10th through 13th. But guess what? Registration starts tomorrow, May 1st. And we will fill up fast. We have room for about 100 kids right now, and we're hoping to add more. We'll be putting those that are over the 100 onto a waiting list. And we will let you know if, you make, if you're able to get your kid into VBS. So sign up tomorrow if you're wanting to get your kid in right away. Remember, VBS is for those entering kindergarten through fifth grade in the fall. We also are going to have a donation display out in the foyer in a couple weeks. And those things are things that we need to even make, make our VBS even more fun. So if you're not able to be part of VBS, then grab a donation uh, item and bring that back to the, us and we will collect it and then we'll be able to use it during our VBS. If you have any questions about registration or any donations or are interested in possibly helping, Contact me and I will be glad to talk about that. Well, hey, church family, today is the last Sunday that our raffle table will be set up out in the foyer. So be sure to, after this service, go check out what we have to raffle off um, and uh, buy some raffle tickets. Uh, and then be sure this Saturday, uh, join us for our mini golf tournament uh, right here at the church. You can register for that online. And uh, we'd love your support as we raise money for our Nicaragua mission trip. Hey, Grace Church. This Thursday night, we're gonna be doing our monthly prayer meeting. Uh, instead of Sunday this month, we're moving back to Thursday uh, to join them with National Day of Prayer. People all over the nation are gonna be gathering and praying, and we wanted to join in uh, with other believers around our nation who are praying. So join us this Thursday night, six o'clock to seven. We will have childcare available, uh, but join us in the sanctuary, not in the fellowship hall this month. Uh, additionally, we have a group of folks from our church heading down to Nicaragua to serve, uh, Jess and Graham are to be going down. And then David is leading a team of high schoolers and young, young adults as well. Several of the team members are gonna be at the prayer meeting, so we're gonna have a chance to lay hands on them and pray for them before they go out this summer. So join us this Thursday, six o'clock to seven, here in the sanctuary. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We are so glad to have you. Just a couple of reminders. If you want to text in a question about anything we talked about today, there will be a telephone number on the screen during the sermon. It's an anonymous tech line. So feel free to text any question in, and each week on our weekend debrief podcast, we will be answering those questions. Also, if you want to contribute to the ministries of Grace Church, you can use giving envelopes put them in the donation boxes on your way out. We also have online giving, and you can also give to the Church Center app. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Well, good morning. As we start off today, uh, as we focus on these first couple songs, they're really songs that are surrendering uh, all to, to Jesus, that, that we would say, I want to be more like you, Jesus. And I love the, the line in this song. It says, you're my life and my treasure, the one that I can't live without. Here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. So just that posture 
uh, of just laying down everything before the feet of Jesus, uh, saying, I can't do it without you. And then the second song is just titled, Lay Me Down, that it's just surrendering our pride, our rights, and just saying, God, I, I really need you in every aspect of my life. So let's stand together as we sing, as we worship today. I lay me down, I'm not my own, I belong to you, I know. Lay me down, lay me down. This time. Yeah. 
God, we uh, thank you so much just for uh, laying your life down for ours, that you are our righteousness, that, uh, Lord, when you see us, now you see Jesus, uh, because you went to the cross, you defeated sin and death, and you rose again. And uh, we just worship you for that. We thank you, Jesus, just for the opportunity to gather as a church, just to lift up your name as your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We are glad that you're here today uh, because we have a special guest with us who's going to be preaching uh, for us today. Uh, but to give you a little context before I introduce him, uh, we are a church that is about worshiping God by making disciples. And we define a disciple, a follower of Jesus, as someone who worships, connects, grows, serves, and reproduces themselves and making more and more disciples. And so we want to be a church that together is doing that. We would be a church that worships together and connects with one another, that we grow in deepening our faith together, that we serve one another in our community, and that we see more disciples reproduced, that we'd see leaders reproduced, and we'd see churches reproduced. And that really uh, ultimately is what we want to see happen here over the next few years, is to see churches reproduce through the ministry of our church in partnership with other churches. And to achieve that, we uh, a few years ago joined the Harbor Network, which is a church health and church planting network. In fact, I was uh, just last week in Virginia um, with the Harbor Network uh, learning from what's uh, called the Bonhoeffer House, which is uh, doing pastoral residencies and training for future church planners so that perhaps we can one day have a similar residency program here to train uh, and send church planters. And, and we want to be a sending church. We want to send people. We want to send resources. We want to, uh, to see churches established. And uh, through the Harbor Network, we have now many partnerships. And one of those partnerships is with a church planner, uh, Bethany uh, Baptist Church in Salem, uh, a guy who I've become good friends with. Casey Loot and his family are here today. And so we want him to tell you a little bit about what God has been leading him and his family to do and the new work that God is going to, uh, to make happen through him and, uh, and those who are partnering with him in ministry. So Casey, will you come and preach to us today and tell us about what God is doing? All right, well, thank you, Dave, and thank you to Grace Church for having me this morning. It is a real and true privilege to be here among you and preaching in Dallas, Oregon, a city I've never preached in, so I'll check one more off the list. Uh, but as Dave said, my name is Casey, and I have served as the associate pastor at Bethany Baptist Church in Salem for a little over nine years and a few years ago, we recognized at our church that God had really positioned us well to consider pursuing the work of church planting, so that we might expand our gospel reach, our gospel witness in our community. And this was something that had been laid on our senior pastor's heart for some time, but we had not really had the right time or opportunity to do it. And it seemed like it might finally be that time. And so as we considered this, and my wife and I discussed this, we stepped into doing something that we figured we would never do, which is to become church planters. And so we felt that the Lord was directing our paths in this way. And as we looked into and pursued what it would look like for me to become a church planter, it was recommended to us that we look into options for assessment and support. And that is what led us to, as Dave mentioned, the Harbor Network, which is what has brought us here today. So in December 2021, I was on a Zoom call with the Harbor Network, something that they call an alignment intensive, and this is a time to learn about the network and what it does and see if it might be a good fit to move forward from there. And while I was on this call listening to what they do and who they are, I kept getting these direct messages on the side from a Harbor staff member saying, hey, I was just out in Oregon. There's so much good stuff happening, and the network's really taking hold out there. There's some good churches that are out there and made efforts to connect me with the other Harbor Network pastors in the area. Uh, Pastor Dave and I had lunch shortly after that, and as my wife and I continued through the assessment process with Harbor last summer, and we've continued to move toward this work of church planting, the other Harbor pastors in Oregon have been really kind to include me in all their times of fellowship, and uh, some of you know I was invited to come and share about our church plant at the men's retreat that happened back in March, which was a great time and was up there for part of it and got to meet some of you there. And so Dave asked me if I might come out here today and share with you all as a whole church, and so I'm really glad to be able to do that. And so from time to time, just meeting with guys and with Dave, I've been able to hear of some of what God is doing in this body here at Grace, and it's really exciting to hear how he is at work among you all here. And so to be able to step in even for one morning and to be a part of that is a real blessing for me and for my family. So I thank God for the opportunity to be here this morning. 
And I want to share with you this morning a little bit about what we are doing with regard to church planting and about how you can support us. And I want to explain why we're doing this. And through that, I hope to direct your hearts, your minds back to the Word of God and the mission that he has for each of us and each of our churches. So I hope you can stay with me through this. It's a bit of a scattered presentation. I'm usually a straight-up Bible guy. Give me one Bible passage, and I will preach my way through it. Uh, we've got a lot to cover today. And so we're going to basically outline it this way. What is the church plant that we are looking to do? What is the work that we're looking to do? And then why are we doing this? What are the biblical pra and practical foundations for that? And then how you can support us and partner in that. So that's our basic roadmap for this morning. I had mentioned that we are in the process of church planting out of our home church, which is Bethany Baptist Church in Salem, Oregon. We are in South Salem. And our intent is to plant a new work also in Salem in order to expand our gospel witness in our city. And we are currently right in the thick of our core team stage, and we are growing together as we look toward planting. And Lord willing, we will be sent off by Bethany on that last Sunday in September. We will covenant together as a new church body, and we will hold our first gathered worship services on Sunday, October 1st. That is all Lord willing. We are holding that loosely, but that is the plan as of now. And we are calling this new work Peace Bible Church, as you can see on the screens behind me. And we chose that name for a number of reasons. Some of you may know that the name of the city of Salem is related to that Hebrew word shalom from the Old Testament, which essentially means peace. That's how it's usually translated. This is why Salem shares its five letters with the last five letters in the city of Jerusalem, because their name means essentially city of peace. So that is the root identity of our city's name. In fact, if you go down to the area in between City Hall and the public library in Salem, there's a big open area with a fountain and all that. You'll see that that area is called Peace Plaza, and there are a number of monuments and signs related to this concept of peace. So there is a local connection to the name, but also a biblical one. Because peace is a prominent concept in the Bible, and peace in the Bible refers not just to the absence of conflict, but to the presence of wholeness or completeness. It's not just that we've stopped fighting, that we started building. And that has great significance for the church. This idea of peace is central to the person and work of Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 2.14, it says that he himself is our peace because he has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. He's broken that down in his flesh. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, has made peace between sinful humans and God. Where there was once enmity, there was once separation there, Jesus has brought the two parties together. He has brought mankind back to God. And he has not just caused us to stop fighting, but he is building something good. He's made peace. This is why Paul says in Romans 5.1 that since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Colossians 1.20 puts a cosmic scope on Jesus' work, saying that he has reconciled to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So we see that this idea of peace is an essential part of the gospel and the work of Jesus Christ. But beyond that, is, is it is essential also to the work of the church. Paul tells the Ephesian church, he says, if you want to walk in such a way that it really uh, affirms and amplifies the gospel message that you preach, you want to walk in a way that is worthy of the gospel, he says, Ephesians 4, 3, you should maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? By living in peace with each other in the church, we demonstrate the supernatural truths of the gospel. We demonstrate that they are indeed true. And also, peace is essential to the individual Christian life. Believers are promised in Philippians that through prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving, that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So God wants us to be people of peace individually at peace with God and experiencing his blessings to us. He wants us to be people of peace corporately as we live in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And he wants us to do this because Jesus Christ has made peace 
for us. And this is the peace and the wholeness that we want to bring to our city through the planting of this church. We want to proclaim it in Christ. We want to model it in our love for one another. And we want to remind each other daily to live in light of it. Because although our city's name means peace, that's not the true identity of our city. It's not a city that has peace. Because our city needs Jesus Christ. And that's why we are planting this new work. We believe that good and healthy gospel-proclaiming churches are the best way to expand the witness of Christ in an area. And so that's why we're doing this. As we have pursued this work of Peace Bible Church, we've made efforts early on to line out what are the things we really want to lean into as a church. What do we want to define us? Who do we want to be? And through that process, we established five core values. And the core values of our church, as you can see, are really nothing new. We identified these five areas that we want to lean into, and they are as follows. First, we said we want to be a church that values proclaiming Christ, the proclamation of Christ. Right? Paul said, him we proclaim. I desire to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. We want everything we do to be to that end, to the proclamation and glorification of Christ. That's how we want to evaluate our ministries, our worship services, our Bible studies, our discipleship processes. Does it glorify Christ? Does it proclaim Christ? Secondly, we want to do that by being a church that is all about the Bible. We want to teach the Bible's big story. We want to teach the scriptures in all of our ministries, recognizing that in the scriptures, there is one divine author who worked through many human authors to write a big picture story that points us back to Jesus Christ. Third, in light of what Christ had done for us, we want to be welcoming to others because we have been welcomed by Christ at great cost to himself. We want to extend that same welcome to others, not just inviting them into church, though we want to do that, but inviting people into the rhythm of our lives, having people in our homes doing life on life ministry. We open ourselves up to others by extending that hospitality and welcome. Therefore, as Christ has welcomed you, so welcome others to the glory of God. Fourth, we want to share the gospel together. We want to be an evangelistic church. We want to do evangelism in community. We want to utilize the whole church to tell together about Jesus and what he's done for us. We want to be praying for one another as we are out in the community and making contacts and sharing Christ with others. And fifth, we want to develop a culture of discipleship. We want to help each other follow Jesus in the course of our regular lives. We want discipling to be an activity that is deliberate and intentional, but at the same time remaining somewhat organic and unstructured, something you don't necessarily have to sign up for, but by being in and around the church, people will take an interest in you and in your spiritual good. So those are the five core values that we have articulated proclaiming Christ, teaching the Bible's big story, welcoming others, sharing the gospel together, and developing a culture of discipleship. And you might look at these and maybe say, Casey, that is nothing new. You didn't offer us anything new. And I say, yes, that's the point. We are not trying to be new or innovative. We are trying to be faithful. This isn't rocket science, it's Christianity. Right? We're trying to do the same things that have been done for a long, long time so that they can keep being done for a much longer time beyond us. Our intent is more to be faithful than we want to be innovative. Not that we're closed off to innovative means, innovative means of expression, but at our core, we want to be faithful to what God has called us to do. And we believe that these five things encompass well the mission of the church. And I think that when things are lived out, there are really radical things in our society. There are things that are not seen very often, and these things can help us to provide a compelling gospel witness to our community. So pray for us as we seek to develop this. Just last week, our core group, we've been kind of identifying who might want to be interested in this through our church. Some people have come to us from other churches as well. We have a group of about, with adults and kids, 60 to 65 people right now. We actually started meeting last week on a weekly basis. We're meeting out as a Sunday school class. They're actually meeting right now. And so this is week two of our core group meetings, and I'm not even there. They don't even need me. 
for this. So that's great. It's a great place to be in as a planter. I've got plenty of guys who say, hey, you take it, you run with it, and I don't even have to worry about it. They are doing fine right now without me. Right now, as a group, we're really trying to dive into that third core value there of welcoming others and hospitality, trying to grow that among our group, which is, can be a big shift for some people. A lot of us live very closed off lives. We're saying, how can we open our lives to others? So pray for us as we pursue that. I want to backtrack a bit here and answer a question that some of you might be asking, which is, why are we doing this? Why plant a church in the first place? In particular, in our scenario, we have a good and stable and healthy church at Bethany Baptist, so why are we breaking it apart to do this? And I want to answer that question, and I'll start with a biblical reason for it. We want to do this to follow the biblical mandate, to follow the call of Christ. I believe that to plant churches is to follow the call of Jesus. And you might ask, where did Jesus ever call for us to plant churches? In fact, he hardly mentioned the church in a direct sense, and he never issued a direct command to plant churches. And yet, I think he implied this in a very familiar passage, and I think it is the call of Christ. Turn with me to the end of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. We will find at the close of Matthew's gospel, after Jesus had risen from the dead, he gathered his followers to himself, and he offered them some parting words. And what has become a very famous passage, this is how Matthew records it, beginning in verse 18, that Jesus came and he said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Many of us, if we've been in church for some time, are very familiar with this passage known as the Great Commission, and it defines the mission of the church perhaps more, perhaps more clearly, more succinctly than anywhere else in the Bible. And this is probably the primary passage in the Bible that is used to teach about topics like evangelism and missions and even discipleship. But how, you might ask, is this passage about church planting? And I think that we get there, we find that simply by considering one word right in the middle of the passage, and it is this word, baptizing. I'll highlight it there for you on the screen so you can't miss it. Jesus did not just tell his disciples to make more believers. He said make more disciples and practice baptism, to baptize those disciples. And when we take a wider look, and what this means in the context of the entire New Testament, we see that baptism becomes the official entrance into the community of faith. It's what, aligns, it's what aligns a person not just with Jesus Christ, but with his people, with the church. Not just an individual spiritual practice, but a community practice. We see this in particular in Acts 2. In Acts 2, Peter preaches a powerful message at Pentecost about Christ had died for the people's sins and how he had risen again and how you know, they had put him to death and all of that. And it really cut to the heart of many of his hearers and they said, what do we do? If everything you're saying about Jesus is true, then we are condemned. What can we do? And Peter told them, repent of your sins and be baptized. And so they do. In great numbers, they do. In fact, Acts 2.41 says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And that's a passage you might be familiar with, but it's probably not a way that you typically speak. If you had a good church event, maybe people came to the Lord through it, you'd say X number of people came to the Lord. Or we had this many salvations, or this many decisions for Christ. We don't often say... Uh, you know, 10 people were added to the number. So it causes us to ask, added to what? What is he talking about there? And I think contextually it seems clear that he's speaking about the church. The people repent, they trust in Christ, they're baptized, they're added to the number of the church. Acts 2.42 says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And you say, that sounds like church. That's because it is church. 
They became part of the local church body. They believed they were baptized. They were put into the church. Baptism was the entry point of that. So I really think that Jesus had church planting in mind even when he gave his great commission. You're going to go out there, make disciples, you're going to baptize them, and what does that mean? You're baptizing them into something. You are forming communities of believers and churches. This is why the apostles in the book of Acts started planting churches. They understood Jesus to have meant this. He had taught it to them. They spread the gospel, they baptized believers, and then they organized those believers into churches on the basis of their baptism. And so the book of Acts becomes a church planting book. And the Apostle Paul, when he comes on the scene, his strategy is to visit urban areas, make converts, organize them into churches, and appoint elders. And only when he had done that did he consider his work in an area complete. And Paul knew, the reason he did this, he knew what Tim Keller writes, that the way to most permanently influence a city was to plant churches in it. We want to carry that same purpose. We want to impact our city. What can we do most? There's a lot of things we could do. But see, if we really want to permanently and most effectively impact our city, we should plant another church in it. We want to try to live out the Great Commission in our context. So that's one reason to plant a church. Because Jesus commanded it, and the apostles modeled it. And we want to follow Jesus and the example of the apostles. Secondly, we want to be faithful to the rest of that great commission, which is to make disciples. And that's not just growing Christians up in maturity. That's part of discipleship. But he has in mind there is making disciples that were not previously disciples. We're talking about new converts, new Christians. And we know that we are not in the same circumstances as the book of Acts. Right? We know this. Obviously, everywhere they went to plant churches, they were planting the first churches in town. It was the first Baptist church of Corinth, or whatever they called it. Not a second. There wasn't a second. There was only one. But we live in a, a day and age where there are a number of churches in our area. Right? In Salem, there's plenty of churches. Throughout the Willamette Valley, there are plenty of churches. I drove down Ellendale to get here, and I stopped counting how many churches I had passed. I mean, this is the second Grace Church that I came to. On the way here so like there are churches and yet there are many among us majority of our residents do not believe the gospel are not following christ the largest religious group in salem in fact is those who say they have no religion or none this group of the nuns which is the largest growing religious group in the country is prominent in our city according to those 2010 numbers you can see there it was 60% of Salem's population. And now no, this does not necessarily mean that these people are all atheists. They might believe in God in some way, they might have some sort of sense of spirituality, but they would not consider themselves part of any form of religion. They wouldn't say I'm a Christian or, you know, even a Muslim or, you know, Jewish, Catholic, whatever. They would just say none. And that was in 2010, 60%. And 2010 may as well be the dark ages for religious statistics because a lot has happened in the last 13 years. And I would say that no doubt the number is much higher today than it was back then. 60% would probably be modest today. Also in 2010, those who identified as evangelical Protestants and those who we would understand historically to hold to a biblical view of the gospel and justification and salvation through Christ they were less than 15% of the population of Salem. Again, that was 13 years ago. So almost certainly that number has decreased. And we also know that not all who profess faith in Christ are truly in Christ. Those who identify as Christian or evangelical or Protestant or Baptist or whatever, they're not necessarily saved from their sins. So it would seem to me almost certain that over 90% of the people living in Salem do not know Jesus Christ. They're not saved from their sins. They're heading towards the judgment of God. That is the reality of the people in our city. And we want to reach these people with the gospel. We want them to be reconciled to their maker. We want them to know Christ. And it's undeniably the case that new churches on the whole are more effective at reaching the unchurched than established churches. And this doesn't mean that every church plant is more effective evangelistically than every established church. But in a general sense, 
Statistically, we see this to be the case. Statistically, the average new church gains 60 to 80 percent of its members from those who were previously unchurched. But meanwhile, churches that are more than 15 years old gain only 10 to 20 percent of their new members from the unchurched. 80 to 90 percent are transfer growth from other congregations. And I would say that bears itself out well at our church in Salem at Bethany Baptist. We're an established church and we see similar numbers to that. And now, no, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying shut down all the established churches and only have new ones. The wider body of Christ needs older and newer churches to bring a balanced ministry and a constant work of renewal and revitalization to an area. Older and established churches do things that newer churches cannot, and vice versa. But one of the things that newer churches have shown to be more effective at is at reaching the unchurched in their community. Newer churches are also more likely to connect with new residents in a community who may already be Christians, but they're looking for a church to join. And there's not the cultural hurdles of getting into an established church body. It can be easier to get involved and connected at a new work. So they've been very effective in that too. But primarily, we want to be a church that will reach people for Jesus Christ. And that's our main motivation in this. We want people to know Christ. We also believe that we can serve as an example for other churches who might be able to do this, whether in their own community if there's need, or maybe one town over, something like that. Bethany Baptist Church is not the biggest church in Salem. We are not the most gifted church in Salem. We are not the wealthiest church in Salem. We are not any of that, but we believe that we are a church where God is at work, where he has brought life into our community through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And we want to take some of that life and plant something new somewhere else. In their book, The Compelling Community, Mark, Je Mark Dever and Jimmy Dunlop call what we're doing here the yogurt model of church planting. I say, if you want to make yogurt, you don't just get all the ingredients and mix them all up. you got to have those live cultures, whatever those are. I'm not a big yogurt guy, but I see it on the container with live cultures. Is that an appealing thing? <laughs> There's something living inside of this jar, uh, but that's what you need for yogurt. You don't just mix the ingredients up. You take something alive and you transplant it somewhere else and you start a new batch. That's what we're looking to do. Dever and Dunlop say this. They say, sometimes the most strategic thing we can do for God's kingdom is to take the precious fellowship he's raised up and then split it apart. And a new church can bear witness to gospel far more effectively than we could ever do ourselves. That's our hope of what we want to do. And we think more churches can do this as well. So we think we can take our church, we can split it apart, for the sake of the kingdom of God and reach more people in that way. People will ask me from time to time, what are you going to do differently so that your church can be effectively evangelistic? And it's, they kind of want to know, you're going to put on a good show, you're going to have, you know, the, the seeker sensitive mindset, you know, whatever it is, all the bells and whistles, lights, all of that. And I said, no, my response, what are we going to do to reach people? We're going to be the church. We just want to keep being a church. Whatever we're doing to reach people early on, it should be sustainable. We should still be able to do it in a decade or, you know, a century from now. We're going to keep being the church. We're going to keep preaching the gospel, keep helping people to know Christ better, keep loving one another, keep inviting people in to what we're doing. The church is the best place, I believe, for evangelism to, to occur. When we turn our focus away from the church we turn to a sort of like decisionism we just need to get people to make decisions for christ if we can hold this event and then people can make decisions for christ and then we can count the decisions and we've done our evangelistic duty but when we turn the focus back to the church we see us turning away from that it turns the focus toward an embodied community in which discipleship happens as a continuation of evangelism you know, a lot of times when people make a decision for Christ, that might not even be their conversion. That might be a first step toward that. What they're really saying is, I'm open to this, I'm open to hearing more about it, but it will play out whether or not they are truly converted. It's the beginning of a journey oftentimes. And the church is a great place to shepherd people well through that journey and to disciple them in that and through the processes of baptism and church membership and all of those sorts of things we can do effective 
evangelism. Last year at the Harvard Network Leader Summit, uh, Jonathan Pennington gave a talk in which he advocated growing churches bit by bit, B-I-T, it was an acronym. He said, build something beautiful, invite people to see God's kingdom at work, and tell a better story. And I listened to this just the other week. I said, I love that. That's what we're trying to do through the planting of Peace Bible Church. Build something beautiful, a community that's founded on gospel. Invite people to come see it and be a part of it and tell them a good story. Tell them a better story than what the world is telling them. And that's what I'd encourage you to keep doing here at Grace too. Keep building something beautiful, a church that is founded on the gospel, that manifests that foundation through love and concern and care that you have for one another. Keep inviting people to come and see what is happening here, not just in this building, but in and among the people in this church. And maybe it'll seem a bit weird to people. Who are these people? Why are you a 20-year-old guy? Why are you friends with this 70-year-old guy? Why get together and have coffee together? That doesn't seem normal. But whatever it is, it might seem weird. But if you really keep loving one another and modeling Christ, it can also be an intriguing place. I don't know what that is, but I'm intrigued by that. And then you keep telling a better story, one that begins with, centers on and ends with Jesus Christ, by whom and for whom all things were created, in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through whom all things were reconciled to himself by the blood of his cross. Keep pointing people to Jesus Christ. And as a church, you will authenticate that message in your love for one another. Just last week, I was at a conference for our regional network of Baptist churches, and I was talking to the director of our, our network, who's a friend of mine, and we were just chatting after one of the sessions, and the host church there, that some of their members had come to the conference, and an older woman from the church came up and talked to us after the session. She said, can, can, would you be willing to pray for me? And we said, yeah, of course, we'd be willing to pray for you. And she said, would you please pray that I could lead somebody to the Lord? And I said, I love that. I love that attitude. Like, of course, we'll pray for you. And then she said, can I share with you my evangelistic method? And see, do you have any tips for me to help? Because I'm not seeing people come to the Lord. And I said, okay, sure. Tell us your evangelistic method. And it was essentially this. Anytime she meets someone new, she asks them their name. That's question one. And then question two is, are you going to heaven or hell? <laughs> and from there, she sees if she can share the gospel with them. This woman lives just outside of Seattle. <laughs> she can be ripe ground for that type of evangelistic effort. She told us a story recently of a man she met named Lucifer, of all things. So what's your name? Lucifer. Well, that's an interesting name. Are you going to heaven or hell? <laughs> he didn't want to talk any further. She's not had any converts through this. I appreciate her heart. And so she said, what do I, what do I need to do different? And we said, hey, maybe be patient. Like, try to build relationships, friendships. Share the gospel, yes, even early on, like share the gospel, but also do this with friends. And we said, you're a member of this church here that was hosting the conference? She said, yeah, I'm a member here. I love it here. This is a great church. It's great people here. Let people come in and be a part of this community. See what's happening here. Let others share the gospel with your friends. All of that sort of stuff. Let them see the love that's manifested in this body and let the church body evangelize her as part of a community. Maybe that will be more effective. And I said, well, I don't know how to, to make friends. I said, well, you know, I've shut up in my home all the time. I said, but we can pray for you. So pray for her, sweet lady. Her name was uh, Alta. She loved the Lord, loved other people. I said, I think there's a compelling way to share the gospel together as a community. Jesus has said that the church's love for one another would be a compelling authenticator of the gospel to a watching world. In John chapter 13, Jesus said this to his disciples. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And that's the beautiful thing that we want to build in all our churches, a community of love that is centered on the person and work of Jesus Christ, that through that authenticates the gospel message that we preach, 
Did you ever wonder about that, where Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, and you wonder, the disciples are hanging on his word, what is new commandment? And it says, you're to love one another. I say, that's not new. That's in the Old Testament. We already have that. Love your neighbor as yourself. We know it. So what is new about it? It's this, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. This type of love is founded on the work of Christ. It's modeled after the work of Christ. It's empowered by the work of Christ. And he says, when you have this among your people, it will authenticate the message that you preach. When you say, Christ has done great work in us. He's died for our sins. He's reconciled us to God. He has brought us in to one people. He's torn down that dividing wall between us and God, between us and others. And they say, how do we know all of this is true? You say, look at what we have here. Love for one another that is beyond earthly explanation. It's a compelling thing. So pray for us as we seek to develop this among our group and grow together to form Peace Bible Church. And we will keep praying for you here at Grace, that the same thing that happened among you in Dallas. We'll try to pray for the right Grace Church. So if we get it wrong, and God blesses those guys too, that's probably fine as well. <laughs> He'll know. People ask me all the time, how can we help and support you? And Dave said, hey, can you share that with us today, how we can help and support you? And again, I have nothing revolutionary to offer. The same things that you have often heard. One, we would ask, first of all, that you would pray for us. And I really mean this, and this is no small thing to us. I presented this, uh, the church plant plan to our church. We'd been talking about it for a long time at our church, but really presented it formally back in January, so three months ago. And I asked for prayers from our church. I said, please support us through prayer. Whether you're going to join with us on this or stay at Bethany, please support us in prayer. And I knew then that we needed prayers. But now, three months later, like I really know it. Did I even know then? I don't even feel like I knew that then. This is hard work. It's hard. My friend Craig, who's a member of our church planting court, and he reminds me all the time, he says, you know, the devil does not want this church plant to happen. He doesn't want it to succeed. He doesn't want there to be a new gospel witness. So this is a spiritual battle. So pray for us in this. Pray that we would have what we need to launch the work. Pray for the people that are coming with us that are part of our core team, even that are meeting right now as we speak. Pray for them that they would become unified in purpose as the church comes together. Pray for me and my family as we step into this work by faith. This is something we have never done before. We don't know exactly what it will look like. So pray for us. And pray for our people at Bethany as well. Pray that they would be joyfully supportive of this work, that they'd not be resentful or suspicious or anything like that. And praise God, most people are joyfully supportive. They're happily, happy about what we're doing. But you can imagine in an established church, and we're going to kind of break it apart and unsettle things, people that are suspicious about that. Why are we doing this? I'm not so sure about this. So pray for their hearts to see what we want to do. We really believe that prayer is important. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul was writing to the church about all this suffering that he had undergone. He was suffering and going through great difficulties. And he said that God was his only hope for deliverance. I'm confident the Lord will deliver me and no one else can. But then he said in 2 Corinthians 1.11, after saying that like God is his hope, God will deliver him. And then he said this, you also must help us by prayer so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So Paul says, God's going to be the one who accomplishes everything. God's going to be the one who delivers us through this hardship. But you're going to help. And it's a real form of help. You're going to help through praying for us. And I feel that in what we're doing too. Anything that's accomplished through what we do through this planting process and the foundation of a new church, anything that we accomplish through Peace Bible Church, it's God who accomplishes anything of value, anything good. But in the providence of God, he has determined that the prayers of people would help toward this, and that would be a means that he would use to do his good work. So please pray for us. It really means a lot. And secondly, you can give financially to support this work. And thankfully, whether you know this or not, if you've given to this church, you're already giving financially to support this work. That is a beautiful thing about partnerships and networks. 
This church is a member of the Harbor Network, uh, devotes a certain percentage of its church budget to go toward supporting domestic church planting. And we at Peace Bible Church, by networking with the Harbor Network, will be grateful recipients of that support. But if you would like to donate further, you can find instructions on how to do that at our website. It's very easy to remember. It's peacebible.church. I opened up these .church domains a few years ago. It's great. There's a link right on the front page of the website. You can't miss it. That's how you know it's a church plant. They're like, hey, if you want to give us money, like, we'll take it. Uh, it you say, well, what are your precise budget needs? All of that. Where are your spreadsheets? Like, I'm sorry, I don't have as, as precise a budget figures yet. Just yet. I have ideas, but we're still working on our precise budget and what all of that will look like. Some of that will depend on where we land location-wise. Maybe you've been wondering. You said you're planting in Salem. Where in Salem are you planting? We have not yet nailed down a specific location. We're gathering a team together based on shared mission and then saying, where can we do this effectively? It seems that the Lord is leading us toward uh, looking for a location that's more centrally located in Salem, toward the downtown core. Bethany is out south, so this would be up north from where we are. So far, our core team that's coming together has been a lot of people from South Salem, which isn't surprising because that's where Bethany is. We've had a good number of people that come from across the river out in West Salem and that sort of area. So we're kind of looking at splitting the difference and saying we could all meet effectively here in the middle of town. So we're hoping for that, but we don't know yet specifically. And a lot of that will determine some of our costs. But regardless of specific costs, we know that church plants are kind of like rocket launches. Right? you got to burn up a bunch of fuel at the beginning to get it up into the air if you want to have a successful launch. There are supplies to buy, there's locations to secure, deposits to make, all of that sort of stuff. It takes a lot. And we think that we are very blessed at Bethany. We're very well supported in our networks. We're part of you know, a regional Baptist network. We're also part of this hard network. And our sending church at Bethany is intending to send us off with a good amount of money as well. To, so we have some money in the bank, a little bit of margin. Our goal is to grow our sending fund to uh, $100,000. And I think we're currently at about $65,000. So if you would like to help us bump that up, we would appreciate it. God does great work through the generosity of his people. And third, so you can pray for us, you can give. Third, you can provide moral support to what we are doing. Be cheerleaders for us. If you have opportunity, share about what we are doing, especially with people that you might know in Salem. Send people our way if you have the chance to do so. Do you know someone in our area who doesn't know Christ? Or maybe they do and they haven't been connected to a good church. There's an opportunity. Could you send them our way? Do you know someone who might be a real gift to a church plant, to a work like the one that we have described today again send them our way i won't tell their pastors that you told them uh, but you know maybe god will call them to you but our website again peacebible.church is a great way to get in contact for stuff like that it's opportunities to give opportunities to write to us opportunities to learn more about what we're doing and as we have more to say in terms of you know location and stuff as we move toward that it will all be posted there. But if you are excited at all about what we're doing, then help us to share that excitement. At our church, we recently finished a preaching series through the book of Philippians. And I was struck again by how Paul describes his relationship to the Philippians as a partnership in the gospel. Back in Philippians 1, at the very start of the letter, he said, I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And Paul is writing this likely from Rome and the Philippians are out in Philippi. They were 800 miles apart. But he says we are partnering in this. We are partnering in gospel ministry because you pray for me and you support me financially. And that word partnership, if you've been around the church a while, you've probably heard the Greek word behind that is that word koinonia, which we often translate as fellowship. Half the churches that have a coffee shop, they call it koinonia, right? And so, but Paul says, we have koinonia here, and I haven't even seen you in years, and all you're doing is paying for me and sending me money. But he says, this is real partnership, real fellowship. It shows that ministries like prayer and giving are real, legitimate ways of participating in ministry work, even as much as close, face-to-face, 
hand-in-hand fellowship. That's what Paul says. I think we'll be surprised at the end, you know, the end of days when all things end, Christ returns, gives gifts to his people. How many, how much work has been done, in particular by those who were shut in, unable to do much else but pray, and maybe give a little bit off fixed income. How much did God use that that we cannot see? Paul said to Philippians, maybe there's a little old lady in that church that was praying for him and giving a little bit to send in the offering to Paul. And he says, you're my partner. Every bit as much as Timothy, who's right here with me, you know, or Luke, who sailed with me. You are of our partners. In 1793, William Carey began the modern missions movement by going from England all the way to India as a missionary. And in that day, there were no missions agencies to sign up with, but there was still a need for support. They had a commissioning service for William Carey that had called people together to help support and to pray for him and send him off. One of his friends said this. He said, there is a gold mine in India, but it seems like it's almost as deep as the center of the earth. The gold mine in India is deep as the center of the earth. What was he saying? He was saying there is a real opportunity for gospel work here. That's the gold that is to be mined. He said, but... It's as deep as the center of the earth. It's a long ways away, and it's going to take a lot, of get, a lot of digging to get to that. And so William Carey famously responded to this friend and said, I will venture down, but remember that you must hold the ropes. I'll go down into that mine and start digging. You've got to hold the ropes for me so I don't fall in. Now, I would not all compare what I am doing my family's doing to what William Carey did in India in 1793. We're not even moving out of our house. <laughs> but I do believe that there is a potential gold mine in Salem for the gospel. That God has many people in our area and that that will become apparent as we continue to proclaim him. And I believe that just like with Carey's work, as we venture in to this mine, maybe not as deep as one in India, maybe not as far away, but one nonetheless, as we do that, we likewise need people to hold the ropes for us. And I thank you for doing that as we partner together, for praying for us, for supporting us. It's that rope holding activity. We could not get by without it. It's such a joy to be able to work together and to reach the people of this region for Jesus Christ. And so I thank you for having me today. And again, I would ask you to pray for us as we continue working toward our fall launch of Peace Bible Church. Pray that we would live out our core values, that we'd proclaim Christ, that we would uh, preach the scriptures and teach them, that we would welcome others with the love that Christ has shown us, that we would evangelize together as a community to reach our community, and that we would develop a culture of discipleship. Pray that as we develop these things, that we would form a compelling gospel witness in our city and we will pray for you and support you too as you continue to seek the same things to build a beautiful gospel witness here in grace church at dallas and beyond let's pray together heavenly father we thank you for this church we thank you for the opportunity that we have had already today to glorify you to hear you praise through the singing of songs, the praying of prayers, the reading of scriptures, and in the love that is evident in this body that they have for one another and for you. God, we thank you for what you are doing here. And God, we pray for us as we move forward and as we step out in the planting of Peace Bible Church, we thank you for your provision of the Harbor Network, which has provided us with assessment and support but also beyond that with fellowship, fellowship with churches like Grace here and others in our state. We're so grateful for that. We pray that as the years continue, that you would show to us even more and more the great things that may happen through this partnership, this relationship, as we seek together to reach people here in the state of Oregon for Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Thank you, Casey. Can we show our appreciation for Casey and his family?
And I'd like to invite up uh, Kelly, his wife, uh, some of his family is here. And then uh, if there's any of our pastors or pastor's wives or elders, elders wives in here, if you come up, I'm going to lead us in prayer over them. But I, I would love to have us uh, lay hands on them as a sign of support and solidarity with them as we pray for them. And then for the rest of you, if you would stand and if you don't feel too awkward doing so, um, instead of laying physical hands on them, if you want to extend your hand forward as we pray over them, uh, I would invite you to do that as we as a church uh, join in prayer as they have asked for and in support of them. And uh, we are just uh, appreciative of them coming and sharing about what God is doing in and through their family. So let's pray for them now. God, I thank you so much for the Lute family, for Casey and Kelly, for their kids. Um, Lord, we thank you for the years of ministry that you have accomplished through them and through Bethany Baptist Church. We pray, Lord, that uh, as you have prepared them for this new work, as you have led them, as you have uh, helped them uh, have a heart for uh, planting a new church, as you've surrounded them with a, a core team of leaders and other uh, new members to, to form this new church, Lord, I pray that you would, uh, you would bless them mightily, that you'd bless them with protection. Um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, our enemy does not want this uh, this work to happen, does not want new gospel uh, proclaiming churches to happen and succeed. And so we know, Lord, that uh, that Casey and his family um, will face opposition, will face uh, uh, attacks, Lord, over, over the next few months as they prepare to launch. And so we pray for protection for them. We pray for provision financially. Uh, we pray for the leaders that they need, the, the key volunteers they need uh, for music and, and other things. We pray for uh, you to provide a space for them. Uh, Lord, as they are targeting this downtown, uh, essentially downtown area of Salem, uh, we pray, Lord, that you would open the doors for just the right facility, just the right building, just the right location, um, that as they move into a particular place and neighborhood, that you would prepare the heart of those in that area to be receptive to the gospel. Um, Lord, they, they, uh, that you would already begin um, to work on the harvest there that they would be able to reap. And Lord, we, uh, we thank you that, you, uh, that we to join you in what you are already doing. And I pray, Lord, that, that Casey and Kelly and their church uh, family would, would see that as they begin this work. We pray for their, their first Sunday in October, Lord, that it would be a joyful celebration of what you uh, are doing through them, that you bring many uh, new people uh, to them. And uh, Lord, that, that we would be able to be a part of that through prayer, through sending financial support, through sending people we know that need a, a new church home, Lord. Uh, we we pray that we would be those who hold the ropes as they descend into uh, this work. We thank you so much that we can hear about what you're doing, that we can join with what you're doing. And Lord, we pray uh, all these things in the great name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you. Will you remain standing as we continue to worship together? You stood before creation, eternity in your hand. You spoke the earth into motion, my soul now just You stood before my faith. I sit and wait upon your shoulders, my soul now is still. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer Total God, completely you. So all walk upon salvation, spirit alive in me. My life to declare. So now, what can I say? What 
Sing this out, last song that I kind of confess that I find my rest in God's presence that we need you.
Gesù Teach my soul to rise to you When temptation comes my way When I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus, you're my hope and stay so Teach my soul So teach my soul to rise Lord, we just declare that today, that we need you every hour of the day. God, help us to make disciples, help us to uh, just live our life with that purpose that you've, you've called us to come as your people to, to share the good news of Jesus, that, that our sins are forgiven, that we're washed clean, that we can walk in forgiveness and freedom. And so we just pray that we'd be able to take that message out uh, as we think about that, that we need you every hour, Lord. We pray for opportunities to share our faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord together today, isn't it? Amen. amen. We are uh, glad that you joined us. We hope we're blessed as you were reminded what it means to be the church, that we would be a, a church body that lives that out as we pray for and support uh, this new church body that is starting in October. Be sure to go up and encourage uh, the loose before you go, and uh, we are so blessed to have you here. Don't forget to come Thursday night for our uh, National Day of Prayer prayer meeting, 6 o'clock right here in this room on Thursday. You are dismissed. God bless. Yeah.